G'day, my name is Will Shackle, founder of New Cliff Australia. Today we are joined by Jasmine Diab. Jasmine is the Australian Managing Director of Global Nuclear Security Partners. She has a Master of Nuclear Engineering from UNSW and is a trusted voice on nuclear security. She is also a former Combat Engineer Officer in the Australian Army. Recently, Nuclear for Australia announced that she has agreed to join our team as part of our expert group. So thank you for joining us today, Jazz. Do you mind introducing yourself? Sure, thanks, Will, for having me. My name is Jazz Diab. I am the Managing Director of Global Nuclear Security Partners Australia. I'm also President of Women in Nuclear Australia. I am an avid supporter of Nuclear for Australia. I think you've got a really great initiative happening there. And I'm pretty active in the Australian nuclear community. But the other side of my brain, I'm a mum, I'm a veteran. I spent 22 years in the army and I'm a bit of a creative nerd. So <laughs> lots of facets to me. <laughs> so how did you initially get interested in nuclear power and why did you decide to all those years ago study nuclear engineering? So it was probably about 10 years ago when the climate change argument was really starting to bubble away. And I wondered why Australia didn't talk about nuclear power at all. Having studied nuclear science as an undergrad, I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't know a lot about the power and energy side. So to keep my nerd brain active, I went off and studied nuclear engineering to just, just figure it out. Because I thought if we're really going to tackle climate change, we need to look at all options. We can't restrict our thinking because we will end up with solutions that are kind of squished to fit a mould. So that's why I went and studied it. Yeah. Mm. And what did you learn from that experience about nuclear power and the possible benefits it could have for a country like Australia? So I guess, like a lot of people, I I automatically went in knowing all the pop culture. So mm. things like The Simpsons, which I'm a mad Simpsons fan, but my nuclear engineering background makes me question some of the episodes. And like sensationalised Chernobyl kind of stories, that's what I knew about nuclear and then studying nuclear engineering made me realize that actually these are anomalies in the 70 plus year life that nuclear power has had globally since the 50s and 60s there have been many reactors that have run safely and securely with no incidents and this has been a form of energy production that has been used successfully for such a long time. And I guess I had not understood a lot of those details because we're quite sheltered here in Australia. We don't know a lot about nuclear energy production. But that course really opened my eyes up to how readily used it has been across America, Canada, Europe, parts of Asia like Japan and South Korea and China for so long with no incidents. And so, yeah, I think that was the biggest takeaway I had from the course. Mm. And what, what specifically, I guess, your area of expertise in, is in terms of nuclear security. So what does that actually mean? What, what is nuclear security? So nuclear security looks predominantly at the material and information in relation to a nuclear installation and whether that's a power plant, a nuclear medicine production facility, uh, a weapons establishment, it's making sure that the information and material is being secured appropriately and, and in a way that deters adversaries for even wanting to go near it. So regular security where you have gates, guards with guns might not be enough to actually secure the material information. It also works closely with the nuclear safety and nuclear safeguard systems to make sure that any new elements introduced into that installation don't introduce security vulnerabilities because adversaries want to get a hold of sensitive information and material. They will exploit any kind of vulnerability that they can see in a system. So it's making sure all, we call them the three S's of nuclear, making sure they all work together so that a facility can run safely and securely and we can benefit from the peaceful uses of nuclear technology. So some people, you know, will bring up the possibility of, you know, what happens if there's a terrorist attack at a nuclear power plant facility? So how would you respond to that question? And in your role, how do you prevent those sort of situations from 
creating a you know really major threat so the biggest thing here is really deterrence making it so undesirable for terrorist organizations to even want to attack a nuclear installation and that's a big part of nuclear security how do you have enough uh, things in place that deter those threats from even considering your site as a, a, as a um, desirable target. So it might be things like physical presence, where it's located, the types of um, security forces that are as part of the installation, uh, things like detection systems. And we call this defense in depth, where you've got lots of different layers of security elements. Some will be quite overt and you will see at nuclear installations, um, big fences, big barbed wires in some places as a quite a visual, visual deterrent. And some will be quite passive and you won't understand that it's a security feature, but it will potentially channel people a certain way or have them look at a certain facility a certain way. And it's things like that, that really prevent, I guess, malicious use of a nuclear installation being used by terrorist organisations. Hmm. What would you say about the security and the status of security of the nuclear industry currently? Do you think that enough's being done to make sure that all of these relevant security measures are in place? Obviously, there's been some people talking about the nuclear power plants in Ukraine and the potential risks facing those. Like, how would you assess nuclear security around the world? I think recently the nuclear security community has really lifted its game. It has understood just how important this is to work together with safety and safeguard systems. So we've seen in, at an international level, the International Atomic Energy Agency really investing in merging its nuclear safety, security and safeguards programs to talk more together. Uh, mm. And Ukraine's a perfect example of this. How have they been able to ensure that the nuclear power plants there and the Chernobyl site are able to be secured and maintain security whilst also allowing the safety functions to still um, be operational? And so I think it's actually increased and got better and that's really been because the Russian forces have threatened nuclear installations as part of their invasion. And it's made us mm. really open our eyes to just how the potential security threat to some of these installations could be. Um, but more importantly, if you now put a nuclear reactor, a power reactor, and especially those ones in the Ukraine that are really phenomenal, if you put them mm. in a state that they're no longer producing power, you now have communities that don't have power or then result in relying on fossil fuel production and we see that with gas lines in and out of Europe and they're sharing energy systems because the reliance on their nuclear power plants was threatened by security issues. Hmm. And you're talking about the intersection there between security and safety. Do you think from your position that nu the nuclear that nuclear power is safe and how do you know that? Uh, I, I think it's safe. I'm also coming from a position of bias being a nuclear engineer but I think it's safe because the nuclear community has this culture ingrained in them and you don't see it in a lot of other industries where mm. there is transparent reporting and sharing across even competitors in private energy production if they've got the same sort of reactor types to make sure that they are running their reactors the most effectively, the most efficiently and the most safe. Because if one reactor has an incident, that affects all the other reactors in the world. And so mm. it has created a safety culture that allows for transparency and reporting and information sharing. It isn't about being, I guess, the best in the world and you're not you're not sharing any information. It is, hey, we as a community need to work together to ensure global nuclear power production is being done safely. Obviously, you know, Jazz, you're based in Australia and Australia doesn't have any nuclear power stations. So what does your work look like in an Australian context 
first of all, does Australia actually have a nuclear industry? There are people who suggest that we don't have any nuclear science capabilities. So what, what are you able to actually work on inside of Australia? Yeah, so Australia does have a nuclear industry. Yes, it is small in comparison to countries that have big power programs, but this is me with my women in nuclear hat on. Mm. I have close to 400 members who are amazing nuclear scientists, engineers, policy writers, lawyers, like all across Australia that look at so many facets of Australia's nuclear industry. Australia produces nuclear medical isotopes that, fun fact, on average, all Australians will get two nuclear medicine procedures in their lifetime. But we also, out at Anstow and Lucas Heights, irradiate most of the world's high-performance silicon. So we have a lot of direct-facing nuclear through Lucas Heights and Anstow. But Australia also injects a fair bit into the global nuclear fuel cycle. So there's a technology called Silex, which is a laser enrichment technology developed here in Australia and now exported out overseas. We have a huge uranium mining industry. Again, they dig all this great uranium out of the ground, but they go and export it so other countries can utilise that for their energy programs. We have a lot of health physicists that deal with ensuring we're safe on mine sites, building sites that all use radioactive isotopes. And personally, from my perspective, with the announcement of AUKUS, what I'm doing is help educate Australian industry in how they can be best prepared to be part of that nuclear supply chain to make sure that they don't have vulnerabilities that will not allow them to be a really great part of that AUKUS industry. So there's a lot going on in Australia. (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely with AUKUS. And I guess in terms of, you know, AUKUS, what nuclear security challenges does that pose to Australia, do you think? I guess it makes us a a target at a state level. We will have access to nuclear propulsion technologies. That means that our uh, cybersecurity processes will need to be high. It means that there will be strict controls on who has access and how they have access. And a lot of these will be imposed on Australia by our partners because it's their technology at the end of the day and they get to say what it is that they require for us to be able to handle that. So I think from a security perspective, it will it will force us to really review how we handle information how we secure material to make sure that we're doing it at a high standard. Obviously, we've, you know, talked a lot about nuclear security and that's your specific expertise, but how would you compare the security of nuclear power stations with that of other energy sources, whether it's renewables like solar panels and wind turbines or even our fossil fuel infrastructure we have in Australia, like our coal-fired power stations? Are nuclear power stations relatively Um, more safe, more secure, uh, or do you think less? Uh, They're naturally more secure because the International Atomic Energy Agency requires them to be. As part of the safeguards regime, they need verification that material is not just sitting in an open field, allowing people to access it, whereas a lot of renewable energies you'll see in paddocks or out at sea for offshore wind. So they are a fair bit more secure. But a reactor also produces its own security footprint, right? As for shielding for a reactor core, you have quite large chunks of concrete and and stainless steel. And so that in itself provides a fair bit of security just in how reactors are designed. Mm. Do you think that there is any, you know, security threat from any of those other energy sources, such as renewables or the, you know, the fossil fuel facilities which might make it them a target? I guess that's a really tough one, Will, because I haven't necessarily like had an opportunity to look in detail mm. at how the other energy sources, I guess, produce security um, vulnerabilities. I, I guess the reason why nuclear really flags the security piece is since the dawn of time, terrorist organisations mm. and states see nuclear material as almost a crown jewel in their ability to threaten people to do what they want. Mm. And so it really is centred on the material in the centre of 
of course, so your, your fuels, a lot of the other stuff isn't really what's desirable by a lot of these organisations. So when we look at things like coal, solar panels, wind turbines, there isn't really the crown jewel that organisations might be interested in. But I'll put an asterisk here. As we start looking at critical minerals and when we start seeing shortages of those critical mm. minerals, that might open up some vulnerabilities. It's whether those materials were, will be in a state that is salvageable for organisations to be able to reuse them into something else. So I guess that's a really interesting mm. one to look at. Are there critical minerals as part of these processes that might become desirable by terrorists or other states? So some people would hear what you're explaining and say, you know, the risk of something going wrong is just too high with nuclear power and we should just forego it completely. What would you say to them in response? Um, I would say, look at, you need to look with an open mind at all energy production globally and have a look at the stats for accidents and incidents. And it is, there's something about the nuclear word that seems to shine in bright lights and make front page media whenever anything happens. But like we saw, I think it was last week, there were deaths at a mine site in New South Wales. Coal fire power plant incidents are quite regular, so regular that they never get reported on. There are incidents of people installing solar panels, falling off roofs, having huge issues there. So I would say open your aperture. Don't just look at what media is showing you. Do the research. Have a look and see how many incidents happen worldwide with energy production. And it will blow your mind when you see just how many people lose their lives in energy production daily. Mm. So I would actually say that nuclear has the smallest stats when it comes to deaths in energy production. There are a lot of other parts of the power industry that have some pretty horrific stats and we just let that happen and we don't bat an eye to that. What would you say about the state of the Australian nuclear power debate at the moment? Do you think it's relying on the science or do you think it's become too politicised? <laughs> I think it's definitely become too politicised and it it kind of frustrates me a bit because I think all climate policy should be bipartisan. We shouldn't be at a risk of our policies changing with every election cycle. That's not sustainable. You look at countries that, yes, they're not democracies, but what countries that have long-term projections on their energy policies and the ability to have that stability in their plans allows them to do deep investment in different technologies, to be able to do some um, experimentation for what works in their climate. And you see mm. it in China, they're almost building one of every kind of nuclear reactor to see what works the best in their conditions. What can they mass produce cheaply and effectively so that when they go to do their long-term energy policy, they can roll out a suite of reactors across the entire country. But that's phenomenal. And knowing that won't change in four years' time, that they're able to deep invest 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and plus, like that's pretty amazing. So I think we need to, we as Australians need to take control of this and the energy discussion and say, hey, politics aside, we need to come up with a solution that will endure a political cycle that will allow my children, her children into the future and then her children to have energy security to have stability, to be able to live a life where they can have an air conditioner on in the summer, charge a car if that's what they want to do. But I fear the more and more we swap around our energy policies, the less likely that's going to be. And we will end up having to revert to things like power rationing and not allowing people to use as much power as they would desire. And I think that takes us backwards, right, rather than forwards. Mm. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jazz. If you enjoyed that interview, please consider making a donation to Nuclear for Australia to support our work, including the work of experts like Jazz, at nuclearforaustralia.com.